Hello, I am Kat Sarfis, forever bookseller at Barnes & Noble. Today we are joined by Mason Hereford. Mason is the owner of Turkey and the Wolf and Molly's Rise and Shine in New Orleans. His debut cookbook, Turkey and the Wolf, Flavor Trippin' in New Orleans, brings the delectable down-home Southern food from his award-winning restaurant straight to you. Mason's style is irreverent, fun, and joyful, and I'm so happy he's joining us today. Mason, welcome. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. I'm pumped. I love that you begin your cookbook with this sort of origin story uh, that centers around like a bad sandwich. And <laughs> it's a sandwich that I think for many of us was like a staple growing up. Uh, obviously for you here, it's this like basic bologna sandwich made with white bread, floppy meat, yellow mustard. When I read it, I like laughed out loud because it was like, for me, it was this tuna sandwich that I ate. It was like this tuna sandwich, white bread. It was always, my mom made it with like either like not enough mayo or like too much mayo. I think I ate it like every day. I think that like, you know, whether, whatever it is, um, for better or worse, I think we have these sort of like food memories um, of our youth and how they kind of shape how we eat today, uh, you know, like how we make food, um, like for like the rest of our lives. So tell us about this, this sort of evolution you have from gas station bologna sandwiches to the bologna at the turkey, at turkey and the wolf. Yeah. So the sandwich I grew up with, the, the crappy one, uh, <laughs> for us, yeah, it's like, you know, if you, you we, like on the way to swimming and like this swimming hole we used to go to, there's this one gas station, we'd stop and get this bologna sandwich. And it was just like, you know, the flabby cold bologna, not, um, uh, not fried in a pan, which even as a kid didn't bother me as much. Um, with yellow mustard, which um, for some reason I only liked yellow mustard on like fast, like on McDonald's burgers. Hamburgers. Uh, when I had it on other stuff, it like I just I hadn't grown into it yet. Now, now I like all, every food. But yeah, bologna <laughs> and yellow mustard on uh, like soft, like stick to the roof of your mouth white bread. I just could not get behind as a kid and it kept popping up. Um, so to make it um, choke downable, I would put as much potato because I think I saw my mom putting chips in hers or something and then I realized that like that was the way out of this mess was to uh put so many chips in there that I could just think about crunchy chips and you know the other flavors would fade away fade away a little bit um but fast forward 30 years or whatever I opened turkey and the wolf with my buddies we had a list in my phone of like tons and tons of dishes that we wanted to serve uh, some of them made on the menu. Some of them had to be tweaked uh, dramatically in order to be ready to to serve to the general public. <laughs> the bologna sandwich, as written, was was good to go. Uh, and basically, what it is is we got a, a bologna made by a friend that doesn't taste anything like the bologna you're used to. It kind of has these cool pate spices. Uh, it's almost closer to what you think of mortadella, but it's smoked and it's cased like bologna, and it's just super good. Uh, it's made by some friends of mine, Leanne and Dan, who have a butcher shop uh, and restaurant called Piece of Meat in New Orleans. So good bologna. We got a, a mustard recipe uh, from my friend's mom. That's the best uh, mustard I've ever tasted that I've been able to recreate uh, using her recipe. We got the chips in there, American cheese, some uh, lettuce, some usual suspects. And then we got a really awesome bread that a local baker named David Weiss based off of our old white bread recipe um, that he recreated for us. Uh, we cut the bread really thick and we butter it. So basically we took that idea of the sandwich that didn't appeal to me as a kid. Uh, and we decided to make everything the best we could make it with the help of a lot of different people that are good at their, uh, that, you know, talented in their own fields. And when we put it together, it was like, finally, we got out of, uh, where we started when I was a kid. This is uh, it. The long answer is, yeah, it's made, <laughs> these, these really awesome ingredients that turned out all right. So you talk about these muses and this, you know, this evolution of the sandwich, but um, you also talk about some other muses, uh, junk food, fancy grandma, uh, grandmommy, your mom. Uh, so what are your, some of your favorite memories with them and, and sort of creating these more food memories? Uh, yeah, it was, there was kind of a dynamic there. Uh, my dad uh, grew up in a family uh, a little more highfalutin, I think is the word I use in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom came from um, Southwest Virginia and uh, grew up, um, I don't know, in a different setting. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I guess 
the, the way we ate uh, at the house fell somewhere in between. But uh, at, at my dad's mom, my grandmother, Anne, uh, at her house, we'd have fried chicken and mac and cheese and corn pudding. And a lot, uh, there's a chapter in the book that sort of uh, pays homage to that dining style, like the Thanksgiving type sides that I'm yeah. obsessed with. Thanksgiving, uh, or I like to call it Thanksgiving. I feel like we're getting past Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> holiday all that but whatever um that that holiday that is currently based all around food um and then my mom um, a really key memory is her mom grandmommy who's uh still kicking uh nice. at 90 years old she is a total badass uh we i went all the way up to virginia to her um recent birthday party at which she just got in her truck and drove home uh like two hours and I was like wow that's a badass 90 year old woman she was like the life of the party and then she's like I'm out you know, <laughs> yeah, very very impressive but she used to do this thing where she would stroll by the fridge open up the door and grab some like hamburger meat like from the grocery store and just put salt and pepper on it and eat it by the hunk uh, I just didn't know that that was a thing that you were allowed to do when I was a kid uh, I, I still, I'm not sure I completely recommend it even at this time. Uh, but I do, I mean, I, as a fan of beef tartare uh, at restaurants, it was a thing. Uh, but that kind of shows the, I don't know, that dynamic. Um, but my formative food memories, I think, were like on the way to school if we missed the bus and didn't have time uh, to, you know, if we were missing the bus, we were already late. So there wasn't some breakfast amount of time to figure out what yeah. we were going to do for breakfast. And we would stop at the country store near our house. And she, my mom would be like, get in there, get some stuff. Let's go to school. And she wouldn't ask any questions. And she'd kind of look the other way uh, on the way to school. And I'd always get Doritos and Snickers bar and Dr. Pepper and these types of things and eat them at seven in the morning. And it was just the greatest thing ever that we could of get. Course. Of course, because I feel like if you're just given free reign, I guess, a kid to go and be like, get, get what you want. Like, of course, that's what you're going to get. I mean, oh, I think yeah. about. It was the best. I oh, love yeah. it so much. I mean, I feel like every, like in the morning, I'll ask my, I, I do, I go through these motions, even though like, I know what he's going to say. And then I have this like argument with him. Like, can we have, can we have like fruit? Can we have something else? But like my son, I'm always like, what do you want for breakfast? And right now we're in um, Ritz crackers phase. Like that's what he wants. Delicious. Like, Ritz, crack Ritz crackers and like apple juice. And I'm just like, like, okay, can we add like a fruit? Can we do like, can we like, I gotta, I gotta do something. We gotta do something else. And it's like, that's, that's what he wants. And I imagine like if I let him in, a, in a, like rain, they would be like, with crackers, apple juice. Perhaps one day he'll be, you know, cooking in a perhaps domestic or professional setting and be like, you know, I really want to reproduce this flavor for my youth. And it'll be Ritz crackers. And he'll be like chasing that Ritz crackers dragon uh, as he as he figure out what he's going to eat when he discovers um, substances that make you starving or whatever. I know. Uh, <laughs> What I will say about the, the junk food thing is obviously, you know, a lot, a lot of people like to cook with nostalgia and, and I'm I fall in that category too. I don't know if you can hear that. My neighbor is doing something wild, um, <laughs> but it's not like I'm just like, oh, I grew up on Doritos. So everything I cook is going to be garnished with Doritos. But I will say that I think it has informed my cooking style, which is like flavors dialed up as high as I can get them uh, more like loud flavors than than sort of a more refined approach that I also have done in the past but it's not where I find myself cooking for myself at the house it's not like soup having cooked and fine dining for you know 12 plus years uh I'm not super technique driven despite mm -hmm. how much experience I have in technique <laughs> cooking uh, I like to sort of ditch the extra steps and go straight for the uh Doritos if you will or something that's like really big in flavor that's sort of more my style no but I love it I, I think that it, it is and I think there's like that you know that mix of it is of, of, of having having those memories and those like you know what that, that foundation whatever it is whether it be junk food whether it be you know higher higher I don't know what, what do you say high falutin you know like <laughs> kind of style um and then you know skills and, and things you pick up along the way. And, and it's just, and I kind of all comes together beautifully. I have so many, I, I do, I, I mean, I grew up with my friends who had these, you know, like wonderful Italian grandmas and they would cook these insane meals. 
and I would come over and I wouldn't even like know like heads had to make heads or tails of like everything that was in front of me. But it's like that and like everything, you know, come comes together. And I think about like when I'm cooking now, it is like you, you can find like traces of like all that stuff. So, OK, so those, you know, early inspiration, early muses. So who's who's inspiring you now? I think a lot of people uh, I think about food constantly, but more so than anyone else, it's the people I work with are inspiring me now because uh, I don't know if you've noticed this about chefs or restaurant owners that the longer they're in the game and the more they end up on Barnes and Noble food uh, podcast, the less they are actually able to, you know, cook on the line for Cooking, a actually. Yeah. Uh, so we have lots and lots of meetings about food. We talk about dishes, but, uh, more often than not, it's the people I work with who are coming up with them. I'm in the conversation, but they're leading the charge on some of these new ideas we come up with. So I'm always inspired by the people I cook with and the people I work with, uh, in, in the restaurants and they're, you know, they're the ones who are inspiring me the most right now because they're making it all happen. That's awesome. And that was actually what I was going to talk about. I want to talk about next because one of the other things that really stuck with me, um, with this book is this sort of like sense of family that you have um, in your two restaurants. So I love that you call out all the One thing people. I will say is any workplace that says they're a family is suspect. So uh, <laughs> I, I'm trying to put that out there without saying it because I don't trust people to say, you know, that sometimes, but yes. Uh, I, get you. I, get you. I hope, I hope we all love each other as I seem to think we do. There you go. So this, this sense of community or this, I, I think you phrased it like, this is like, it's like a community of misfits, you know, cooking in the kitchen. Take me through like an average, an average day. If you're not doing a, a Barnes and Noble podcast uh, and you are going into the restaurant, uh, take me through sort of like, what's, what's the, what's your day? What's, what's going on? What's my day, man. Uh, I, I guess it really depends on if, uh, you know, the grease trap is messed up like it was last <laughs> week, but like on a really good day where. Good day uh, my with involvement- no grease trap. <laughs> where, where my involvement is limited, which is, is very possible because, as I said, the people that run the restaurants now are no longer so much me uh, and they're better at it than I ever was. So it's it's a good situation for, for me. Um, but I'd start my day, uh, you know, wake up next to my wife, maybe do a Wordle, get the Wordle uh, out of the way. Uh, we, have a, we have a group text of... Um, the uh, cooks at Turkey and the Wolf who also do Wordle. It's a group of five of us. It's an accountability so, text. So it's a competition uh, then? Uh, no, no, not so much a competition as when somebody gets it in like two tries or something really good like that, or God forbid, one try. Uh, that probably yeah. wouldn't work. That, that <laughs> uh, you know, you get like a clap or, or whatever. And then if, uh, you know, the rare time where you don't get the word, uh, there'll be some... Um, gifts like a patting you on the back or like oh i think it's about making sure everybody gets to their wordle and then feeling celebrated when they do well and supported when they fail uh which is inevitable um that sometimes you're gonna miss your wordle and you gotta you gotta get there you gotta understand that it happens it happens uh so after that uh me or the wife or uh ideally both of us which never ever happens would take the dog darla for a walk she's over there um and then i would go check in at molly's i spend more of my time at turkey and the wolf our sandwich restaurant than at molly's our breakfast place because um my wife was the front of the house manager up until recently at molly's so she was the other owner so there was like you know she'd be at one and i'd be at the other um and we're trying to eventually expand to a new restaurant and we want to make sure that she's fully replaced. So that's not what's happening now. But the people that run Molly's do such a good job. And I just, I get in the way. And uh, if they're really busy, they ask me to get out of the way. If they're a little less busy, we have a nice conversation. Nice. Uh, I get a sweet tea. And then I'll run food to a couple tables, talk to some people. Uh, and then I'll head over to Turk and Wolf where I'll spend most of my time for the day. Uh, right now we've been recipe testing fried chicken. So the first thing I eat almost every day is fried chicken for the last 10 days in a row, which is, um, equal parts wondrous and sort of like terrifying from a health perspective. Um, and then Nate, who's like sort of the co-chef and I 
talk about why the chicken still isn't where we need it and what we did wrong this time around. Mm -hmm. um, and then Phil, who's working on more refined dishes for a future restaurant project, will meet and talk about the dishes that he's working on. Um, and yesterday, that was a chicken piccata flavored butter for a bread and butter plate, which was really cool. And he's crushing it. And that dish is literally blowing my mind. And I'm really proud of that. And then um, by 11 o'clock, they'll be ready to have the line set up. Uh, I'll, you know, say hi to the front of the house and do some high fives and whatever. They'll tell me what's going good or bad and we'll, the restaurant will open, at which case I'll walk around and look busy or disappear and go run errands. Um, <laughs> and then a bunch of stuff will happen between 11 to 4 uh, or until 2 at Molly's when Molly's closes. There's service, you know, yada, yada. I either I'm a part of it or I'm not. And then uh, at 4, 4.30, when the kitchen's clean, the front of the house is swept and mopped, et cetera, we, um, we sit out on the patio and have beers and make jokes. Uh, sometimes it's two of us or 10 of us, the whole team. And then they usually go down the street to Barrel Proof, the bar, uh, where they continue to have fun. And we continue to sort of half talk about work, half not, because you can never really escape it. But, you know, you always kind of want to talk about it. And then um, that's like an average really good day. Bad day, it's like grease trap overflows. It's like a, a health disaster. We want to shut down the restaurant forever. There's a hurricane. We want to move to Maine and, you know. But that's, yeah. those are a few and far Those are, yeah, those are a few and far But no, but those are always, those are always uh, interesting days. All right. So I don't know how, I, like, I can't, I got to ask you this question because it's been, it's been like killing me. Um, I need to talk about the plates. I need to talk oh, about the McDonald's plate. I need to talk. <laughs> I, I ate off those plates for like the entirety of my childhood. <laughs> like, and I'm pretty sure my mom still has them. Although I think that my sister may have stolen a few um, before I was able to steal them. That's the downside of being the baby of the family. I feel like I get like, you know, you get like the, the, the dregs. So I, I don't know. I need to know everything. I need to know like the why, the where, the how, like, how'd you get them? Where'd you find them? What made yeah. you decide to have them? <laughs> Um, well, it's the, the easy question answer is where'd I get them is eBay. So that's one word answer. Yeah. I was um, kind of figuring, I was like, oh, it's probably eBay. It's probably we do eBay. have two, we do have 200 of them. So I would not be surprised to that we have one of the larger collections of, uh, vintage, uh, plastic McDonald's plates that exists in the world. I mean, I'm sure somebody has more, um, but Generally, I, you know, I just look for good deals on like lots of plates on, on eBay. And, you know, if I'm lucky, I can find them for less than five bucks a piece. Um, but yeah, now we're up to 200. We've been collecting them for, you know, we've been open for six years as of a month ago. Um, the original idea came from our glassware. So we opened with just buying plates from thrift stores as a lot of restaurants do yeah. to uh, make like a cool hodgepodge uh, set of dishes that if they break, it's not the end of the world, low investment and they look neat and they're nostalgic, etc. So we started uh, out that way as a lot of restaurants do. And um, all the furniture from inside Turkey and the Wolf and the opening glassware, my mom all bought, uh, my mom bought all of it at thrift stores and um, antique shops um, and, you know, things such as this uh, in and around Virginia, where I'm from. So in like rural Virginia, outside Charlottesville, uh, uh, we, I went up there for Christmas and she was like, what do you want for Christmas? Everybody gets something that's $200 for Christmas. Uh, and she bought me a $400 table for Turkey and the Wolf, uh, which was double what you're supposed to get for Christmas, which was pretty cool of her. She kept texting me pictures of uh, tables. What do you call that stuff? Uh, Formica tables with like, a lot of times yeah. with the Chrome messages. We found one and I was like, that'd be so cool if all the tables were these colorful tables. She continued to find uh, them one at a time and store it in like this dilapidated shed outside of her house. She would text me and be like, what do you, how do you feel about this one? A couple of them, you know, I sent her money for a couple she just bought on her own, which was very kind of her. Uh, and she collected all the opening tables and chairs for the entirety of the opening of Turkey and the Wolf. And she put it on the back of a pickup truck with rope. Um, and her sister and her drove down from Virginia 15 hours to New Orleans looking like, what is it, like the Clampets trucks? Is that what <laughs> we And she drove all the way down there with a 
you know, like 20 foot high stack of tables and chairs. And then it started raining halfway through and she had to get a tarp and all this stuff. And then all that stuff lived in the hallway of my apartment for uh, six to eight months while we we're trying to open Turkey and the Wolf. We put it inside. Uh, it looked really great. And it's all still there today. And all of Turkey and the Wolf sort of came together this way of people adding in and it all just, you know, it's kind of just found objects everywhere. Uh, but she also found a lot of cups at a store that are the old that you could get at fast food restaurants uh, that have the cartoons on the glassware, yep. the old Disney characters and Looney Tunes and these type of things. She found uh, someone who was selling them and they had 80 cups and she was um, able to buy all 80 of the cups for one dollar, a dollar 50 or two dollars a piece. Uh, depending on you know how they valued the cartoon yeah, yeah, yeah. outside of the glassware and um so that was our opening glassware and like people were taking pictures of them they thought it was really neat we were all obsessed with them since then they've all broken or you know walked <laughs> walked out the door people would bring in those glasses uh if they had some at their house they're like oh i don't need this anymore you guys have this cool collection and then someone eventually brought in a mcdonald's plastic plate that i was so into that i was wondering if there were more out there because I didn't uh, know the Ronald McDonald ones. We had like some Disney ones and some other ones that we had bought at McDonald's, but I didn't know that there was these really awesome ones with Ronald McDonald's yeah. face on them and like Grimace and all these characters interacting. And it turns out there's hundreds of different designs. Oh, yeah. So what are the 90s nostalgia are you going to bring back? I think I saw a photo of you with some sort of uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle wall or a curtain behind oh, right. you. Yeah. So over um, the quarantine part of the current COVID pandemic is uh, we had to, you got to stock up on a lot of to-go stuff. Yeah. Uh, well, our, our dining room was closed for a long time. So it was just sort of the, the dining room evolved into a massive closet to get back open. We had to <laughs> rectify that situation. <laughs> and we, we basically bought, you know, a, a massive shelving a shelf, I guess, uh, to put boxes of uh, to-go boxes and, and other like to-go silverware because we knew when we opened we were still going to have like a high percentage of to-go yeah. business so we to cover it up to block it from the dining room we got the big um, ninja turtle sheet uh, that a lot of people recognize from either their bed or a friend, sleeping in a friend's house everyone's seen it if you didn't have yes. it you wear yeah. the sheet you saw it uh, yeah. I, I found the sheet at this amazing store uh in mid-city new orleans called junks above and this guy collects all these really cool old toys we use them a lot to decorate our breakfast restaurant which is sort of like a totally inspired by 80s and 90s toys um but yeah we got at junks above and that's the, the ninja turtles 90s sheet that is just so epic and so nostalgic i love it I love it. Okay. All right. I'm going to get back. I want to get back to the cookbook. What was the inspiration to create it? So like you, so you collaborated with the great JJ Good. Um, your brother did the photography. Um, right. So this must, this is obviously a personal experience for you. How did that start? I guess we had some pretty good accolades at the beginning of Turkey and the Wolf, um, which was, you know, we, we didn't know it was coming and, and it was sort of a really special thing for us. And after that, people were like, oh, you're going to write a cookbook? And I was like, uh, no, I don't. I mean, is we, that just like the next step? Like, oh, you get, yeah, like, you get some just, good reviews. Well, like, I guess it's people that <laughs> people that sell cookbooks were the ones asking, you know, yes. it's like, hey, are you interested? They saw an opening there, I guess, because we had, you know, received some fanfare. Um, fast forward a few years. Uh, I'm already friends with JJ Good because he moved to New Orleans for a while and he would eat a coquette a lot. And he, he was friends with my brother. So there was a connection there. We would go hang out and go out to dinner from time to time. And I just looked up to him. I thought he was so cool. He had written the Pock Pock cookbook when I, you know, and some other books that I that had in my collection as I was just starting to cook. So he was sort of like a celebrity in my eyes when we became, became buddies. And uh, he, he was friends with my brother who's done a lot of photographs for cookbooks and he's a photographer, a professional photographer, uh, more talented and more established than I am a cook. <laughs> So it was very natural that if we did a book, it would be with my brother, Will. And Will and JJ basically said, hey, it's time. Like you, you're in a position where you've got something to say. You have enough uh, recipes. We all want to work together. Let's do it. And I was like, if you guys say so, let's do it. Uh, so it wasn't some burning desire 
uh, within me to create a book, even though I do creating is very fun. Uh, they they said we, I was ready, so then I was ready. <laughs> um, <laughs> you so got yeah, the JJ, blessing here. Yeah. <laughs> JJ had one sort of proposal using some uh, photos my brother had already taken for a couple articles that we uh, had done together and for some pictures that he had taken for me to use uh, on our website. And we shopped it around. We used JJ's agent, Kim Witherspoon, and she got us hooked up with 10 speed. And then, you know, we made a book. Yes. Um, but yeah, it came into being because two very talented people told me that it was time. And I said, OK, well, if you guys are both saying it. I'm I guess I guess I'll do it. I guess I'll, <laughs> well, it's it's great. I mean, like the photos, the photography is obviously brilliant. The writing, it is. It's um, I find myself like reading it like a book. Like I mean, obviously you're reading for the recipes, and it's you know it's like fun to be like, oh, I'm gonna try to make this. But there's so many great stories in there um, that I think it's it's sort of like transcends just cookbook. Um, so thank you really, very much for saying that. I will add that you can read it cover to cover in like half an hour. So danger uh, to the book. <laughs> but yeah I could, I could minus the uh minus the like recipe steps there's a lot there of that obviously. um but no i thought it, it, it was great like i said i loved the, i loved the obviously the nostalgia of it the names everything it's just really great um so i know you touched upon this a little bit before we were talking when you were talking about um you know what's your, your typical day and things that you're working on um but so i was gonna just ask you so like what's so i was gonna ask you what's next and you kind of talking about um chicken fried chicken yeah, so yeah. What, yeah I was like is it, you know where if it's working on new recipes uh new sandwich yeah, testings and you kind of touched upon that so I'm going to ask you so what about this yeah. chicken what's next ideally we will have learned to make fried chicken after oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we're not open a fried chicken restaurant um but we we uh we have a few ideas of how to make our next move as a team we have two chefs at Turkey and the Wolf and two chefs at Molly's Rise and Shine, our breakfast. They're both, they sort of co-run the kitchen and um, they have put so much in the restaurants. They're all very good at their jobs and um, so creative and talented and, you know, their managerial skills are, are also really impressive. Uh, and it's sort of time for everyone to level up, uh, be it move on or do whatever else. And we've decided uh, whether that that is the restaurant sort of helping them, supporting them uh, as they move on to their next role, whatever it should be, or if we want to open up a restaurant together. And we have decided the latter, if all the cards fall into place. So the two chefs at Turkey and the Wolf are Nate and Phil. Nate is from rural Alabama and is interested in eating, uh, opening up a meat and three style restaurant, uh, what we would call down here a plate lunch joint. Um, and he's got the culinary chops and the, you know, the Southern accent and the skill to pull it off. Uh, Phil is a little more interested in cooking refined food. He took over the kitchen of uh, a fine dining restaurant I used to work at uh, after I did. So we have a history of cooking um, some more refined dishes together. Uh, so he's interested in um opening a place that's uh, a little more wine and cocktail focused, but has a menu where you're charging, you know, 15 to $25 rather than five to 12, like we are yeah. at Turkey and Wolf and using some of those ingredients that we don't have access to because of our price point or the casual nature of, of what we do. Um, so we're currently on the hunt for uh, a restaurant location that serves one of those two needs, whichever one we find that chef will move on. The other chef will sort of take over the lead role rather than sharing it at Turkey and the Wolf. And then our next sous chef in line will, will move up to co-chef. And then at Molly's, because Liz and Colleen already um, run the place without me, they are gonna, they're going to come on as owners so that they, you know, they can, they'll just own the place and run it without, <laughs> there won't be this like, wonder what Mason thinks about this. We'll be like, we'll all just, you know. Yeah, this is what we think about it. <laughs> right. uh, and eventually, if, you know, the restaurant industry is tough, it's a weird time. This this could be a two-year plan or it could be a 10-year plan. That's the ideal future as we're currently discussing. That's amazing. Oh, so many good things, like future, like all good things, sending you all the good vibes. Um, and so now I have a, I have a personal question. Um, where does a girl in Brooklyn find Duke's mayonnaise? 
I don't know. It's up there though. Uh, <laughs> is it? We, I don't know which grocery store has it, but I know the the wholesale purveyors are supplying it to a few restaurants because we've now done uh, uh, more than a couple. We've probably done like four events in New York, and each time they've been able to source Duke's mayonnaise. They might sell it at Meat Hook Butcher. So we just did an event at Meat Hook and they got us a bunch of Dukes. They might actually sell it. They have a, a retail section at their butcher shop at the Meat Hook in uh, Williamsburg. Maybe try there. And if, if they don't have Dukes, they have incredible uh, sausages and, and cuts of meat and sustainable uh, beef and chicken and lamb and pork and et cetera. Oh, that's amazing. I'm gonna say my, I think my favorite dish in your book is the collard green melt. That is one of the more popular things that we I, restaurants. For a reason. And I was just, I was like, when I was reading it and trying to obviously create it, and I love the idea of like the soaker slice. It's like, this is what every sandwich is. Like any like runny. It's like the uh, the club sandwich middle slice uh, for there for a different reason. Yeah. To get yeah. soggy. I love it. I love it. And I, I actually, I'm just, I'm just also on a personal note. So I'm a vegetarian. Um, and I love that there's like veggie, veggie sandwiches in here and they're awesome. I mean, obviously Thank the collard green, I've, I do eat cheese, so vegetarian, but the collard green melt, but also, uh, and like so many ways you can just obviously uh, adapt recipes, but then my other shout out has got to be the sweet potato burrito. Um, just delicious. I mean, I'm, I think that's that one's got Colleen written all over it. One of the oh, chef's yeah. Molly's, uh, those, that combination of flavors was born in her brain. Yeah, I love it. I was like, anything I had ordered, um, I had had, I don't, it was like a Mexican restaurant and they were doing it around here and they do breakfast and they have a, a tater tot burrito. I mean, it's obviously not Mexican, but the, the, they have a tater tot burrito and it's delicious. Mexican. Yeah. And I, so when I, when I, I opened this and I saw, I was like, yeah, with French fries, like sweet potato waffle fries in a burrito. Like, this is what we need more of this. Like this you kind know of who food. does awesome Tex-Mex tater tots and tater tot tacos is Redheaded Stranger in Nashville. You should check it out. It's super good. Okay. Anything. If you're telling me like tater tot, like, yeah, tater tot burritos blew my mind. So now it's like tater tot tacos. I should just like continue my tater tot sandwich. And then there's the pun, the tachos. <laughs> so just, I'm just gonna, um, I'm gonna have like a food, a food journey, like a food road trip where I just find like tater tot, tater tot sandwiches. Okay. Um, <laughs> that sounds perfect. Um, all right. So I love my last question for you. So I love to, um, cause it's fun and we're Barnes and Noble. Um, I love to, I believe like, you know, what we're reading kind of says a lot about us or what we're watching. Uh, I love to absorb culture, whether it be books, uh, you know, other media. So, um, I love to ask people what they're currently reading. Uh, it feels like it's a little window into who we are. So, um, obviously you're very busy, but, uh, what Not are you currently reading? What are you currently reading or watching uh, or, you know, doing when you're not sort of running uh, two restaurants and everything else that you're doing? Well, they run themselves do the team, but uh, I am there uh, and I am terrible at reading. My reading comprehension couldn't be worse, but uh, I listen to a ton of books. And when I do open up a book, I open this one, which happens to be sitting right next to me just when you asked Look at uh, that. without getting killed or caught. Uh, it's about Guy Clark, who I love. I don't know if this is appropriate, but I got Guy Clark right here, right? And then my dad's right here. So, uh, <laughs> you know, there's that. Uh, and that's pretty amazing. And I'm, I've am i been meaning to watch, there's a documentary that you can only watch by going to a website and renting it uh, on Guy Clark. And I think there's a really good Towns Van Sant documentary on uh, one of the streaming platforms that I've also been meaning to watch. Um, but I love that old music. My old man, uh, who uh, is now deceased, he was obsessed with that music and it's affected my whole family. And, you know, it's being obsessed with that and the Grateful Dead and stuff like that is, is a way that we all connect with him still. I love it. And that photo that you have, well, that it's, it's in it's in your book. Now, I was like, I feel oh, like I just is. had yeah. it. Good point. Um, and it's so great just the way uh, the way it's set up with like the sandwich and then holding the sandwich and, and the PBR can. And it's it's so great. Um, and my brother, um, if you look at that picture, the way that he um, composed the photograph, the background behind where the painting is positioned is where the photo was taken. So as the power lines drift off the page, you can see the power lines before it. 
and the top of the house behind it. That's like a cool little I know. thing. It's just a photo, a photo within a photo. Within a photo. It's very, uh, I don't know, what's the word, meta. I was just, I was, I wanted to say that and I was like, I hate, I don't want to say I that, it. but, but it, is, but it is sometimes you just gotta, you just gotta call her what it is. Um, all right, Mason, thank you again. This has thank been you. wonderful. Uh, Toki and the Wolf flavor tripping in New Orleans is out now. Uh, I highly suggest you get it and make everything in it. Um, including the bologna right here. Lots of chips. Yeah. No sandwiches complete without, without being just stuffed with chips. Wonderful, Mason, thank you so much. Kat, thank you. Uh, sorry that someone's been weed whacking outside my window the whole time, so hopefully it hasn't been so bad, but it's been super fun talking to you. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. The show is available on Apple, Spotify, and Stitcher. Please rate and review us wherever you listen to podcasts.